Hello everyone, my name is Jacqueline Jarakis and I'm the Expeditions Manager for Earth Echo International. We are so excited to have students and people from all over the globe joining us as we learn about seaweed aquaculture today. Earth Echo International is a global nonprofit. We were founded on the belief that the youth have the power to change our planet. Reaching more than 2 million people in 146 countries, we provide original content, immersive experiences, and trusted resources to empower young people to become leaders and problem solvers in their communities and around the world. Just wanted to give everyone watching a reminder that you can send in questions for our expert via chat today. We will break throughout the presentation to answer those questions. You can feel free to type them in the chat space if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're watching on Zoom, please use the Q&A app. I'm excited to introduce our host today. Jacqueline is a Marine Extension Agent Associate, excuse me, with Marine, with the Maine Sea Grants and University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Jacqueline works to develop the seaweed sector in Maine with an emphasis on sustainable seaweed production, post-harvest processing, and product development. She engages in applied research, provides technical field assistance and organizational support for the seaweed industry. She also supports educational networks to bring marine science to coastal communities. And we're so excited to have you here today. So welcome Jacqueline and great name by the way. All right, thanks Jacqueline. Um, I know it's always so funny to have another Jacqueline on the line. Um, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Jacqueline Robidoux and as other Jacqueline said, uh, I'm a Marine Extension Associate uh, with Maine Sea Grant and University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Um, so I am Zooming you guys uh, from sunny Portland, Maine here today. Um, and I'm gonna teach you a little bit about uh, seaweed farming, a little bit about the background of seaweed biology, um, and then get into some of what seaweed becomes and how we interact with it um, every day. So I'm going to share my screen with a little, um, with a little help from technology and everything will go great. All right, so um, I always like to start talking about seaweed by kind of addressing some of the different names that we call seaweed. Um, it's really kind of strange, right? Like some people call seaweed seaweed. You hear it called algae, you hear it called macroalgae, microalgae. Some people just call it straight up gross. Um, and so, you know, how do we break these down and what do each of these mean? Because to a lot of people, their interaction with seaweed is something like this. Um, you know, it's icky, it touches you, you don't see it. It has this mysterious life that we don't really know um, all that much about. And so one question that I get a lot is how did you get into seaweed? Um, and so the background kind of there is I always knew I was interested in marine biology and I was really drawn to seaweed because it's again kind of mysterious and we don't know that much about it. And so I really wanted to know more. Um, on top of that, I'm a huge foodie. And so when I found out that you can actually eat seaweed and we eat it all the time, whether you realize it or not, um, I was really interested in that. So uh, some products that seaweed shows up in um, when it's not touching your leg in the water are things like toothpaste, ice cream, chocolate milk, salad dressing. Yeah, is your mind blown yet? Um, sushi, a lot of people have eaten seaweed and sushi. Uh, medicine. And then another way that we all interact and are connected to seaweed on a daily basis um, is actually by the oxygen that we breathe. So a lot of oxygen comes out of obviously the oceans and seaweed is a large part of that. Um, so with that, uh, there's actually over 12,000 species of seaweed in the world. Um, and I always like to remind people that in addition to being really important for um, primary production and nutrients and ecosystems, um, seaweed is are also really important for people. Uh, so there's about 221 species that are considered to have uh, commercial value. And so these help to sustain um, coastal communities all over the world. Uh, so back to that slide where we had all those names up there, right? Um, so microalgae and macroalgae. And this is something that um, I get this question about a lot. So I always like to break it down. Uh, microalgae are single celled organisms. So they're microscopic. Um, they're freshwater and they form the real base of uh, marine food webs uh, or actually freshwater food webs as well. So when you see microalgae, it usually just appears as like water discoloration. Um, and this would be things like red algae blooms, um, 
or harmful algae blooms. Uh, it's in lakes, so a little bit of fresh water and salt water. Macroalgae, on the other hand, are macroscopic. So you can see them. You don't need a microscope to see their whole form. Um, and in addition to providing habitat, they also provide food. So uh, again, you're going to mostly find these in the oceans. Um, and so this is what we really think of when we talk about seaweed. Uh, so there's a few different types of seaweed. Um, the groups are based on color. So reds uh, are red, brown, and green. Uh, red seaweeds are going to be things like nori. If you've ever eaten a sushi roll, you've eaten a red seaweed. Uh, the brown seaweeds are going to be things like the kelps um, and the rockweed. So uh, brown seaweeds are typically pretty, can be pretty large. And so people associate those um, with, you know, in your head what a seaweed is. Uh, and then sea lettuce is an example of a green algae. And those are, um, you know, some macroalgae, but then a lot of the microalgae are actually green. And so this is all based on their pigments. Uh, so a little bit about what seaweed does in the environment. Um, obviously, seaweed is a photosynthesizer, so it's going to be taking up sunlight and CO2 and nutrients. Um, and there's a few reasons why this is really important. So this functional role um, is removing carbon dioxide from our oceans, and it's also removing nutrients, which can in excess be kind of harmful. Um, and what we get out of that is obviously oxygen and living biomass. So, um, you know, oxygen is important to all different types of marine organisms. And uh, for seaweed farming, actually, we'll see that seaweed farms do really well next to farms of other kinds because they provide the animals more oxygen. Uh, and then for the living biomass, what comes out of that? Uh, things like structure and habitat, marine food webs, and then we eat it. Um, so, I, I get this question a lot and it is, uh, is seaweed a plant? Um, and so my answer is seaweed is similar to plants, but it's actually not the same. So even though seaweeds are photosynthesizing and they're primary producers, um, they don't have true plant structures. So plants have things like roots and flowers and transport systems. So the answer is no, seaweeds are not a plant, um, which always leads to a second question, which is, but like how close are they? Um, so this is uh, allowing me to nerd out here for a minute with the uh, tree of life. Um, and so seaweeds are actually a polyphyletic group, which means that they belong on in different categories of the tree of life, which is really unique. So to just orient you to where we're at, um, right down here, we have humans. Up here, we have plants. Things like the red algae, like a nori, if you've ever eaten a sushi roll, kind of close to plants, but still not plants. Uh, green algae, like we talked about, also kind of close to plants. That's the closest to plants. Um, and then finally, kelps and brown algae are on the opposite side of the tree of life. So, uh, you know, they're way out there in right field. <laughs> um, so it really is pretty unique that the last common ancestor of some types of seaweed was a single celled organism. Um, and so with that, uh, just to orient us to a little bit of the structure of seaweed. So um, the base of the seaweed is called a hold fast. So that's what's going to be essentially holding on to the surface that the seaweed grows on. Um, it's not like roots. It really doesn't perform any nutrient transport. Really, all it's like, a, it's like a monkey tail. It's just holding on for dear life. Um, the part that kind of looks like a stem is called a stipe. Um, the whole piece of seaweed is called a thallus, and then seaweeds that have blades obviously are called, a, you know, we call that a blade. And then there's a few types of seaweed that have special, uh, special features, you know, they're more advanced, they're like your iPhone X. Um, and so those are going to have uh, receptacles, which are little areas that contain the spores and then air bladders. Um, and so if we were in person, I would challenge you all to question what the function of an air bladder is. And um, the answer is obviously when the water comes back in, that helps the seaweed to float and be upright and absorb as much sunlight as possible. Um, so now- so Jacqueline, gonna... sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Before you go okay. on up to more about this, the seaweed, um, anatomy, if you will. Um, we had a question from Jenna on YouTube, and she wants to know, is seaweed in a different kingdom than plants? Since we were talking a little bit about the tree of life. Yeah, so if we, I can actually rewind here. So seaweed is um, one, two types of seaweed are in the same kingdom, and one is actually in a different kingdom. Okay, um, great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, and that's that'd be what polyphyletic means. Yeah, all set? <laughs> 
All right, that answers that one. That's a good one though. <laughs> All right, um, so a little bit about how seaweed grows because this is really important for how we farm it, obviously. Um, so the meristem is the region of active cell growth in seaweed. Um, and something that's unique is that seaweed doesn't all grow the same. So something like a rockweed like we have right here has an apical meristem and that means that it's building like a plant. Um, similar to a building, you know, you have your first floor and then you build your second floor and your third floor. Um, but other types of seaweed like the kelp on the right here actually grow from the bottom. Um, so that's going to be much more like a fingernail. So it's actually pushing out the oldest seaweed is going to be at the end and the youngest seaweed is going to be at the beginning. Um, this is really important for farming because you could actually trim the seaweed and it's still going to grow. Um, and there's a few other ways that seaweed can grow. Um, some seaweeds grow from the sides out and some just grow wherever. So different ways that seaweed can grow. Um, and seaweeds are really complicated uh, in that they're ancient and they have these complex life histories and they do things that plants do not do. Um, so you can see right here, we have the kelp life cycle. Um, and so you can see on the right, there is this like nice, or on the left, there's this nice, beautiful blade. Um, and that's the sporophyte. So that's gonna be uh, like us. It has two sets of chromosomes um, and that's the really more stable life form for kelp. Uh, and then it releases spores and these spores actually turn into a filament that has only one set of chromosomes that then makes more spores and then goes back to a kelp. So it's, it's pretty complicated and it's not that straightforward. Um, and if you think this one is crazy, you should see other types of seaweed because they are even more crazy. Um, but one thing that I'm gonna just put a, a, a ping in everyone's mind to remember is right here with this spore release, because this is really, really important for farming. And it's a large part of why we farm kelp, um, at least in the United States. So just remember that. Uh, so a little bit more about farming and just seaweed industries in general. Uh, you know, we have two ways that we get seaweed, basically uh, wild harvesting seaweed, which has been around for uh, a longer than human life itself, essentially, and then also aquaculture, which is sometimes called farming or uh, seaweed cultivation or mariculture. And so this is newer, but that being said, still a pretty old practice. Um, and it pretty recently began in the United States. So a uh, few facts about seaweed globally. Um, the global seaweed industry is worth more than $6 billion. Yeah, who, who knew? Uh, something that touches your foot and is kind of gross can be so valuable. Um, and the cultivation of seaweed dates back to the 15th century in Asia. So people have been cultivating seaweed intentionally for a really long time. Um, and finally, in 2016, there was 3.1 31.2 million tons of seaweed cultivated. And what does that number actually mean? Well, that's about 4.5 million elephants, which is about 10,000 uh, more elephants than we have on the planet. Um, so lots and lots of seaweed. Uh, and you can see seaweed farms from space. Um, so you see right there, what you're looking at is actually all of those little uh, cross marks are seaweed. Um, so that's a GIS image of seaweed from above. Uh, some, some like closer up images of what seaweed farms worldwide look like. Uh, this is a tropical seaweed farm in Tanzania. So you can see the seaweed is in little like bunches and they keep it under the water and then they harvest it by hand. Um, and so worldwide, most of our seaweed comes from farms. 96.5% um, of seaweed is farmed uh, and only a small sliver is wild harvested. In the United States, on the other hand, it's pretty much the opposite. Um, so most of the seaweed that we use in the United States is wild harvested. Uh, and, but that being said, since 2010, way more seaweed is starting to be farmed. So, um, and I, I guess we can pause here and just kind of talk about how crazy it is that this is this industry only started 10 years ago for the United States. So just remember that when we talk about everything after this with all of the farming, it's only 10 years old. Um, so, you know, think back where you were 10 years ago and wow, you know. <laughs> um, <Right. so. laughs> and Jacqueline, um, if you could go back to the images of um, people taking seaweed out of the ocean, yeah. where are those from? Those are in Tanzania. Okay, and kind of you go along with that. Another question from YouTube is, where is the most seaweed farm? You might be getting to this, but I wanted to throw that question at you. 
Uh, so the most seaweed is farmed in China and Indonesia. Um, there's some, there's quite a significant amount farmed in Japan um, and Korea also. So uh, most of the seaweed farms worldwide would look something like this. And the And Jacqueline, I cannot hear you. Looks like we lost your audio. One sec, Jacqueline, we lost your audio. Could you speak one more time for me? <laughs> Am I back? You're back. <laughs> okay, Technology, cool. what can we do? So I'm sorry, We um, last we heard was talking about Indonesia and Japan and what the seaweed farms would look like. All right, everybody, just hold tight. Looks like we're having some technical <laughs> difficulties. There we go, Jacqueline, I think you're back. Let's try again. Hello. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, go ahead. All right, sorry about that. This, it's so funny, these things never happen except when, you know, you're like live on YouTube, so. <laughs> yeah, never um, happens in the practice, right? <laughs> never. Um, so yeah, so the question was, where is the most seaweed farmed? Um, Indonesia, China, Japan, Korea are some of the, the top ones that farm seaweed. All right, awesome. Um, are there any other questions while we're kind of have a pause and are dealing with the internet? <laughs> I don't see any questions um, coming in on YouTube or Zoom. Um, oh wait, we just got one from Natalie. She wants to know what is the difference between farmed and wild harvest seaweed? Great question. Yeah, so um, farm seaweed typically is going to be, um, well, first of all, farm seaweed is intentionally cultivated. So they're choosing species that are uh, commercially valuable and they're, they're making seed uh, and then planting those seed out on a structure. Uh, wild harvest seaweed is just um, farmer, or not farmers, but harvesters have a bed or an area that they know has uh, commercial seaweeds and they return to that same bed. Um, so kind of like mowing your lawn and then it grows back and then they do it again. Um, so that's the that's a little bit of the difference between uh, just the two practices. And then some of the differences, um, farm seaweed, there are some that are, um, you know, you can really tailor the species to the area versus the other way around where you're looking for a certain species in a certain area with a wild harvest. Fabulous, thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome, so I will move through here. Um, so in the United States, we grow kelp um, and a few important things to keep in mind about kelp is that it is a cold water species and it has a fall to spring growing season, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, it lives always under the water. So you're never gonna see kelp um, you know, dried out in the tides and then coming back unless it's a super low tide. Um, and it can also survive under ice and in really high energy environments. It actually really likes that, you know, like a lot of waves, um, which we have plenty of here in Maine. Um, so where is seaweed farmed in the United States? On the East Coast, we have uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New York. So kind of all of New England and then uh, New York as well. And then on the West Coast, uh, Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and California. So uh, it's possible that you're joining us from a state where seaweed is currently being farmed, which is pretty great. Um, so just a little bit about the hubs really of seaweed farming in the United States. Uh, seaweed needs clean, cold waters and a lot of space. So uh, the Northeast and the Northwest are two areas where that happens. So really Maine and Alaska are two hubs of seaweed. Uh, in Maine, we had the first seaweed farm and we now have over 200 sites permitted for seaweed. In Alaska, they have about 22, but the numbers can be deceiving because the farms in Alaska are really big. Um, so 22, but they're large. And then a few other places where things are going on with seaweed, you know, New Hampshire has some research farms. Um, there's some shallow water research farms in New York and then some commercial farms in Connecticut and Rhode Island and Mass. Um, and then on the West Coast, there's a, an interesting blend of a lot of research that focuses on the environmental benefits of seaweed. So things like, you know, if we farm seaweed, does that make it 
uh, a candidate for carbon credits. And there's also um, tank culture. So people who are growing seaweed on land in tanks. Um, so just a little bit about Maine and why we farm kelp in Maine. Uh, you can kind of see the coast is really jagged. So there's a lot of space and it's a lot of cold water. Um, and so those are our 200. Each of those little dots represents one kelp farm. So that's our 200 kelp farms in Maine. Um, so a little bit about what a farm actually looks like. So what you're looking at here is uh, basically what the kelp farm would be under the water. And so it's suspended with buoys and the green line is the line that holds the kelp. Um, so it's really straightforward and the, the gear is pretty minimal when it comes to um, different types of aqua farming. Uh, so that's what it looks like above the water. And you can see right there, um, all of the buoys and then those are the lines where they would be underneath. So that's about um, 10 lines of kelp under the water. Um, so now I wanted to point this out because this is really important when we talk about the season is water temperature. Um, kelp is a seasonal vegetable or sea vegetable really. Um, and so right now we are approaching the off season for kelp, um, which you can see the highest temperatures of the year. We don't want kelp in the water for that. Um, so during this time, uh, seaweed farmers will uh, sometimes become or start their commercial fishing um, for things like lobster and they'll have to remove their farm gear from the water and they can prep gear for the next year. Um, in the nursery season, this is when kelps, uh, kelp nurseries start to look for wild pieces of seaweed that they can produce seaweed seed with um, and farms go back into the water. So this kind of starts up in September and runs through about November. Um, Starting around the middle of October, seaweed starts to get planted out on the farms. And so we'll, we'll do a deeper dive into all of these bits of the, of the farming. But um, you know that is when a lot of the seaweed is going from the nursery to the ocean. Um, from essentially January to the middle of April, this is the major growth season for seaweed. And one thing I'll point out here is this dip in March. So uh, when you're looking at the temperature, the lowest temperatures are going to be right around February and March. And this is really important because this is when we see the biggest growth in seaweed. It's a huge boom. Um, and that correlates with sunshine, actually. So seaweed loves sun and it loves cold temperatures. And so the months where we start to get more sunshine, but the temperatures remain really cold would be like February and March. So a lot of seaweed biomass growing during that season. Um, and one other thing that I'll point out is about at 50 degrees is the 50 degrees Fahrenheit is about the water temperature where other things will start to grow on the seaweed. Um, so it's really important, you know, most of our seaweed is being um, fed to people and we don't want a bunch of other critters on it. Uh, so that's kind of what is really the end of the harvest season here, um, at least in Maine, you know, is once that water hits 50 degrees, um, this kelp starts coming out. So uh, during the harvest season, it's crazy. All of the kelp in the whole state is coming out of the water all at once. Um, it's really fun. And that is actually, we are just wrapping that up right now. Um, so a little bit about the process of farming seaweed, like we talked about. So in September, um, the nurseries go and find this wild seaweed. And you can see that dark patch in the middle is actually the reproductive area of the seaweed. So if anyone ever finds a piece of kelp and you hold it up to the light and you see that kind of like chocolate strip, that's going to be where the spores are. Um, so essentially what they do is they take a piece of this and they put it in water. Um, and so they, the spores kind of release in water on their own. Um, and what we're actually looking at here is seaweed spores. And you'll notice that they're swimming. Um, so if you didn't believe that kelp wasn't a plant before, believe it now, kelp spores swim on their own. Um, so that makes the job of getting them onto a line kind of easy because they just swim to your gear, uh, essentially. So that's you know what would be in that little container. And then what happens is that solution gets inoculated in a tank pretty much like this. Um, so what we have here is some pipes and then around the pipes is just a bunch of twine. Um, so the seaweed spores go in, they hit the twine and then they start to grow and they grow really fast. So this is an example of what a commercial seaweed nursery looks like. Um, and this is in Alaska. So you can see lots and lots of tubes um, but the technology is pretty simple. I mean, again, 10 years, we've only been doing this for 10 years. Um, and so 
right here, this is after about a month of growth. Um, and you can see the seaweeds forming on the, the surface of the line and it's kind of fuzzy. Um, and if you zoom in, you can see there's even more little seaweeds there. So actually each kelp spool can have about 6 million baby kelps on it, um, which is a lot of kelp. <laughs> So many babies. Now, Jacqueline, real quick, when you showed the kelp spore swimming, what do they use to swim? Do they use like a flagella, cilia? Yeah, so kelp spores have a flagella and they, they will use um, light and chemical cues to kind of, um, in nature, figure out where an appropriate place for a kelp bed is. Um, and in our tank systems, they just swim uh, right to a surface and when they can hit it and stick to it like the, like the kelp twine, um, they'll just grow there. Fabulous. And could you go over one more time the difference between kelp and seaweed, those terms? Mm -hmm. So uh, seaweed refers to all macroalgae. So that's any type of uh, algae that is multicellular and you can see with the naked eye. Um, so kelp is a type of seaweed, but uh, seaweed is a blanket term and kelp is one specific type. Um, I'm trying to think of a quick example, but none of what is similar, but none is coming to me. So uh, does that answer that question? I think so. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we just looked at the uh, big kelp nursery in Alaska, but again, like I said, the technology is pretty simple. And so actually on the right here is a seaweed nursery in a middle school classroom. Um, so you can see they've done the same process. They took the kelp, uh, they sport it, it's on a spool. Uh, and then on the right, this is actually some of the students planting the kelp with a partner farmer out in the ocean. So you can see, ooh, you can see their farm uh, right back there. And um, it's really cool because the students get to learn about kelp in the classroom. They get to see the whole biology. Um, you know, they actually get to see it swimming and then it goes out onto farms. And so we have uh, quite a few teachers and schools that are doing this program now, which is really neat. Um, and they, at the end of the season, will partner with those farmers to get some of their kelp back and have even tried to put it in their cafeterias. That's really um, incredible. Yeah. And we have a question from Yasmin on YouTube that, that kind of goes with that story. And that is, can you do home aquaculture with seaweed? If you were going to do home aquaculture, I would say seaweed is probably your best bet. Um, you know, I, I'll rewind here and just show really what you need is a tank with cold seawater. Um, the biggest challenge to growing seaweed in a tank is definitely what else is going to grow before the seaweed starts to grow. So if you keep the culture clean um, and, you know, you have cold water and nutrients and appropriate light, uh, you could do this in your house. <laughs> That's really awesome. We had a virtual field trip to an aquaponics farm last week. And so we're really interested in, in kind of, you know, growing some more food at home and things like that. Yeah. Um, how do teachers get involved with your program? Um, so with this one, we kind of, it actually started with a teacher who went out on a limb um, and was doing a bunch of different aquaculture projects. So they were doing oysters and then he thought, well, that wouldn't, wouldn't that be cool if in the off season of the oysters, we could do kelp. So it's kind of like the whole, you know, animals and aquatic um, organisms together. And so he started this kelp nursery project in his classroom. And since then, um, we've been working together to bring it to other classrooms. Um, so it's a really great teaching tool because his students learn about the biology and all of the science stuff, but then also some of the real world problem solving. So it's a, a whole network of teachers that um, use aquaculture as a learning tool for their classrooms. That's great. And I imagine that it probably includes some engineering too, right? When you're kind of to just, you know, build out your system for the little spores. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some technology too, like, um, you know, if you really want to get super scientific, you could model the, the flow of the system or the nutrients in the system. So there's a, it's really interdisciplinary. And that's one of the, uh, one of the cool parts about learning with seaweed is that students get the opportunity to, to really plug into whatever part they are most interested in. You know, I've seen a lot of seaweed art projects, which come out beautiful. Yes. Um, and real quick, before you move on, are there any warm water species that can be farmed or grown and used um, as far as seaweed? I'm in Florida and I know from, you know, going out to the beaches, I see like sea lettuce and sometimes I see red algae, but obviously we don't have the big kelp here. So is there any warm water species that can be farmed? 
Yeah, worldwide, there's a bunch of warm water species. So like that uh, farm that I put up in Tanzania, that would be a warm water species. Um, an example of a warm water species that we're actually starting to get here is called Gracilaria. And so it's kind of like this tufty, it has a lot of branches, um, kind of looks like a drift, like a little tumbleweed. Uh, and that's a warm water species that is really actually delicious. Um, so they use that in um, Hawaii, I believe they might um, either wild harvest it or farm it and it goes on top of poke bowls. Um, it's really crunchy, it's got a nice snap. So for human food, uh, definitely. And then other ones that have uh, really great properties that can be extracted, things like um, sargassum is a really uh, widely spread seaweed. And so there's tons of uses. Um, you know, when people ask me, what can you do with seaweed? That's kind of like asking, what can you do with plants? You know, we like live in plants and we eat plants and I'm sitting on wood made from plants. So the, the, uh, the um, possibilities are really endless. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And last question, because um, it has to do with that initial grow out stage for the, the baby kelp is, um, in the, in the wild, is there um, the ocean waves, are they a challenge to farming kelp, especially in that kind of initial baby phase? So actually the baby kelp holds on really, really well, like way better than you would think. You know, for 6 million little tiny microscopic blades on there, you would think that the waves are gonna just completely knock them out. Um, but something that I always have to, you know, think that I always think about is that the kelp finds these spots in the wild on its own anyway, and kelp really likes wave action. So the more wave action, the more nutrients, the more mixing of the water, and so that's going to be beneficial. Um, so when those baby kelps are settling, that's kind of something that is already biologically designed to like stick and hold on and deal with the waves because in the end, it's going to be really productive. Great, thank you so much. Awesome, so now we get into another video. Um, and this is actually how the, far, how the kelp gets out on the farm. So that's one of the spools from the nursery. And this would be like that green line that I showed you guys in the farm design. And it's very complicated technology here, people. Um, all that you do is you pull the boat back with the seaweed on the line and you can see it's kind of just unspooling. Um, and so that's how all of the kelp farms in Maine are kind of uh, spooled. So moving back and wrapping around that line, um, you know, it's, it's so simple, it's really cool actually. Um, so once that is done, you can see the baby kelp is on that twine and it's wrapped around the grow line. And this is where the hold fasts come in. So remember, like we talked about, um, they don't serve any actual transport function. They just stick on really tight. Um, and so what happens is they start to hold on and the seaweed starts to grow. So that's after about a month. Um, this was probably, we planted this in December. And so this one on the right is January. So one month. Um, month one looking good. Um, something I always like to remind people that we are out there in February. Um, so it is a really, really cold time to be on a seaweed farm. But, you know, at this point, farmers need to go out and make sure winter storms haven't um, moved their gear and the seaweed is still there and the lines haven't snapped. So, you know, it's it can get pretty chilly out there when it is uh, 11 degrees and you're trying to tie knots um, and the wind is blowing and it's freezing. So uh, things start to look up in, um, <laughs> in March. Um, so you can see this is like where that seaweed boom starts to take off, right? Like the sun is coming back, the water is still cold, um, the nutrients are starting to flow in. And uh, in about April, that's what the seaweed looks like. So tons of growth. Um, so you can really see that what we started with on that line just in a few months, you know, from uh, essentially October to April, um, you know, six or less months, tons and tons of seaweed growth. Um, it grows really, really fast, which is great for, um, you know, the ocean and for our food system. So uh, in May, this is when people start to harvest. So you can see this farmer here on the left is kind of spraying down the kelp just to get out any little critters that might live among it. Um, so obviously when you put a seaweed farm in, it kind of forms a natural habitat under the water. So we'll see things like little fish and eels, um, snails sometimes will grow on it, um, crabs. We hope there are no crabs because that means that the seaweed is touching the bottom of the water or the bottom of the ocean and then it, they kind of like climb up and you don't really want that. Um, 
Well, there's tons of life that grows around these farms. And then on the right, you can see that's after the line's been stripped. So what's left is just those holdfasts and stipes. Um, and this is a few pictures of seaweed harvesting. So how it's done is it's just uh, sliced right off the line and then put into uh, food containers or like bags. Um, and then this is a video, and I thought this one would be cool to include because this is actually one of those students. Um, he's a seventh grader and he's out harvesting kelp. Um, so you can see they're kind of just cutting it, putting it in a bag. I don't know if you guys can hear the audio, but it's super windy. So uh, that is pretty close to real life. Um, you know, it's a challenge because the boat is moving and it's rocking and you're trying to cut the kelp while not cutting yourself. Um, so it's it's really fun. Um, and that's kind of what a day out here on the water looks like right now with all the kelp harvesting. Um, so a few things just that I always like to remind people, it's so new. So there's a lot of things that we haven't figured out yet. Um, and this is something that I always like to challenge um, students or other folks to think about, um, you know, that's a lot of seaweed that we just looked at. And the reality is, is that most of these boats are pretty small. So how much seaweed you can take out of the water is actually limited by how much seaweed you can fit on your boat. Um, kelp is also pretty heavy. So, you know, if you're just an individual seaweed farmer, that's a lot of lifting. Um, also seaweed is a seafood. So when it comes out of the water, you have a pretty limited time to keep it cold. So you wanna make sure that you have a plan for it. You know, you can't just take it out and be like, I'll leave it in my yard for a few days. Um, doesn't work like that. And then uh, another thing that I always like to point out is that remember you saw that line and there was all the seaweed that was left on it. Um, we leave some behind and so, in other types of farming, you know, you want to make sure that you're utilizing all the different types of the seaweed and we don't have a market for that yet. So what that would look like, um, these little balls of the stipes and holdfasts, which are actually really nutrient dense and could have some uses we just don't have uh, markets for yet. So that's something that I always like to challenge people to think about, like, what could we do with that? And Jacqueline, going along the lines of that, um, how positive is the seaweed farming for the environment? We, we did an expedition uh, last year all about sustainable fishing. And, you know, there are some challenges with farmed fish versus catching fish in the wild and vice versa. Do you think that that is the case with um, seaweed farming? Yeah, so I mean, seaweed farming is super environmentally positive um, because it's giving off oxygen and it's actually taking up uh, carbon dioxide. So, you know, seaweed farms have been shown to locally mitigate the effects of ocean acidification because essentially the ocean is a giant sponge for carbon. So the more ways that we can find, um, you know, like seaweed, which is going to use those carbon building blocks and turn them into uh, a different form, you know, uh, binding them up and then we use it is one way to get some of that carbon out. Um, and in addition, the high oxygen helps other organisms. Um, you know, I, I think a really important thing that seaweed does is take up some of those nutrients. So things like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus because nutrient balance is really important. And if those if those swing up, then other things will start to grow. So things like microalgae, which can sometimes be toxic. So if you've ever heard of uh, like red tide, that would be an example of a bunch of microalgae that are using all of those nutrients to grow. Um, in the alternative situation, if we have seaweed farms and we have kelp growing, then they are using that those nutrients. So instead, um, we don't end up with toxic algal blooms. Great, and it doesn't seem like you're using any pesticides or anything like that in the seaweed farming, are you? No, so actually seaweed farming has no inputs. So uh, minus the gear itself, there's no fresh water, no pesticides, you don't feed it. Um, you really have to only maintain it to make sure it's still there and um, you know it's growing healthy, but uh, it's really pretty, um, pretty passive in terms of what you put in and it's positive in terms of what you put out. That's great. And David wants to know, could you tell us the price of one kilogram of harvested kelp if it was dried? Okay, so let me think. I, um, here, here is where I am really bad with conversions because I am in the United States and don't know anything about the metric system outside of liters and milliliters. Um, but just for a reference, dried kelp, the price can go, I mean, 
it's so new. So it's really, really actually hard to pinpoint price. Um, you know, we see kelp that sells uh, fresh for, um, you know, fertilizer for pennies. And we sell, we see kelp that sells fresh for $20 a pound. So um, it's all over the place for dried kelp. Uh, typically, one thing I like to point out is that when you dry kelp, it goes it, about one, it's about one tenth of the volume. So um, typically that could be somewhere around $30 a pound, but that's really a, it's a, it's a loose ballpark for um, kelp and dried kelp because the markets are so varied. Great. And one last question from YouTube right now, and that is earlier you talked about seaweed being in a lot of our products like toothpaste and ice cream, but what purpose does it actually serve being in those products and items? That's a really good question. Um, so the purpose that it serves is it's a thickening agent. So uh, for example, like in toothpaste, it's going to help keep it thick. Um, it also um, has a lot of properties that hold up really well to food preservation. So um, it, you know, seaweed doesn't really freeze in the same way. It's really unique in that sense is that so it's super resistant to freezing, um, which an ice cream might help prevent freezer burn. Um, so typically it'll be like a, a thickener um, in cosmetics. It can be a thickener, uh, baby food, you'll see it. So it's kind of everywhere to, to give things a little bit of that um, thick texture, which, you know, when you, when you touch seaweed, it has a little bit of that like bouncy resilientness. Um, and so that's, they essentially utilize those properties and then put them in a bunch of food, um, cosmetics and medical products. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So um, this is just a chart of how much seaweed has grown, at least even here in Maine in the last um, five years. So you can see in you know 2015, we had about 50,000 pounds. And now last season, we had about 300,000 pounds. And this year, it's expected to about be double of that. So it's a really exponential growth curve. Um, and it's really, really taking off. And the number actually on the side here is the number of farmers that are reporting. So you can see in 2015, there was only four. And then in 2018, that number quadrupled and there's 16. So more farmers, more seaweed. Um, and the farmers are also, I'll add, the farmers are also getting better at what they do. So each season they come up with new techniques. Um, a lot of the farmers are fishermen. So they've lived their whole lives on the water and they're really knowledgeable about the area. And so, um, you know, they, they come up with the best gear ideas. They'll say some, you know, we should use this buoy instead of this buoy and it totally works. So it's really neat to see how that's also evolved. Um, and so where does the seaweed go? So this is kind of going back to the question that we just had, but a little bit more specifically for the seaweed that comes out of the water in the United States. Um, the majority goes to value added food products. Um, so value added means something that uh, might be like shelf stable or it's frozen. Um, it's not just straight up seaweed. Um, some does go direct to consumers and then a smaller volume goes to non-food uses. So things like um, you know, cosmetic bars or um, soap, stuff like that. So uh, food, cosmetics, agriculture, and animals. Um, so you've probably heard about uh, seaweed being fed to cows uh, to reduce methane emissions. And so that's something that's kind of in the experimental phase here and kind of worldwide. Um, and the small volume goes to that and then other. So you know, seaweed has um, a ton of properties that can be used for a ton of things. And that includes stuff like biofuels and plastic synthesis. Um, so you can really do a lot with it. Um, and that is a, that's an area that I think we'll see more of in the future. Um, so some of the challenges with seaweed um, after it comes out of the water, um, processing and access to processing. So like I said, it's, it's a really quick turnaround time and it needs to go somewhere. You need to have a plan. Um, because you can't just let it sit. So that can be a challenge, especially where some of the largest farms, like in Maine, our largest farms might be far away from the places where the seaweed can get frozen or dried. Um, it's a limited season. So you guys remember that graph, you know, it's all coming out of the water at the same time, which means there's like this huge seaweed overload. Um, and then the final thing I'll point out is the market. So, 
seaweed on its own isn't the most consumer acceptable product. You know, sometimes people are like, ooh, I don't want to eat that. Or what do I do with it? Or even if I did want to eat it, I still don't know what to do with it. So, uh, you know, coming up with products and ways to familiarize people with eating seaweed because it is super healthy for you. So all of those nutrients that we talked about, um, it's good for the environment, but then it's also really good to eat. Um, and so these are some examples of just some of the products that our seaweed becomes. So stuff like seaweed salad and kimchi and kelp cubes. Um, you know, we have kelp puree and you can put that in salads um, and like in soups, um, seaweed sprinkles, which are awesome on avocado toast. I do that for breakfast all the time. Um, seaweed teas, which are really great. So, you know, again, some of those really healthy components of seaweed mixed with all these other superfoods um, is amazing. Uh, kelp jerky, um, which, you know, everyone always asks, does it taste like real jerky? And I, it's a little different, um, but it's still, it's great, you know, as a vegan alternative and it's uh, super sustainable. Um, and so I kind of wanted to wrap this up with this big question that's on everyone's mind, um, that how is the seaweed industry responding to COVID-19? So obviously things are different. People aren't going out, restaurants are closed. So that's been a challenge uh, for the industry here. Um, so large volumes of seaweed, like those shelf stable products that we just talked about, the big farms are able to contract out their seaweed to processors before the season starts. So all of those kind of processors shifted and they made a bunch of products and those are distributed all across the United States um, because again, they have a longer shelf life. And then for smaller farms that usually rely on um, restaurants and other contracts, um, they started dock to door initiatives. So things to bring seaweed right to consumers, which is kind of the first time that's ever happened. Um, just because, you know, before no one really thought about getting a whole box of seaweed and eating it, but now because of uh, COVID, it's kind of a little different. So uh, just a little bit about how that has worked because this is something that, you know, I'll put this out there. All of these pictures and information happened in the last two weeks. So this is like up as it is happening. Um, so you can see there's fresh kelp being delivered direct to the doors. Um, some of the farmers came up with their own seaweed cookbooks so that people would be more familiar with how to cook it and what to do with it. Um, you know, we came up with these kelp recipe cards so people knew um, where, you know, what do I combine it with? Uh, we, we essentially said that you put it whatever, you, whatever you do with spinach, you can do with seaweed. So that's kind of where we started to work from um, and, you know, really neat. So more kelp cards. Uh, everyone was super excited about it on social media. So a lot of the farms that have uh, Instagram and Facebook were sharing it and people were sharing their recipes, um, you know, kelp poke bowls. So it was a really cool way to celebrate like a super seasonal product as it's happening and as it's responding to um, this pandemic um, and, you know, distributing with other types. So this is some seaweed going out with oysters, um, the whole little fresh kelp kit. And then the last thing I wanted to point out was remember those students that I talked about at the beginning. Um, so they actually, because they were no longer in school and their, uh, you know, their kelp was out in the water and they weren't going to be able to bring it into their dining, uh, into their cafeteria, um, they started a kelp seaweed contest. So, uh, and they all posted a bunch of blog entries about the types of seaweed that they were using and uh, ordered a bunch and cooked it up at home with their families and then like shared and had a contest. So I thought that was just a super cool way that, um, you know, those classrooms adapted to um, remote learning and kind of incorporated seaweed, which they had learned so much about into some fun, um, you know, seaweed week challenge stuff. So um, again, it was really cool to see this all kind of happen. And I, I put the links here because I know a lot of people are using social media these days. Um, and it's a really cool way to learn about recipes and just seaweed knowledge. Um, so Seaweed Week was kind of a celebration of the Harvest Festival, but it's really turned into Seaweed Month because um, people just want to know more about it and they want to try it while it's available. So, um, you know, those are just some pictures of all of the different seaweed products that happened. And so with that, it looks like we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and I'm happy to answer some questions. I'll stop sharing. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, Jacqueline. This has been really awesome. So we do have a couple of questions. 
first we have a comment from David and he uh, says, it's not a question, but he has seen some seaweed products like that. Um, that you showed in his local grocery stores, um, which is great. So um, Ro on YouTube would like to know, how does the nutritional value of the type of seaweed uh, vary by the style of processing used, but then also maybe by the species as well? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And it's a really uh, broad question because each type of seaweed has its own nutritional profile. So uh, something like a nori, which we eat in sushi, is going to be really high in protein. Um, something like a dulse, which is one of the red algaes that I talked that I showed earlier, um, is going to be really high in omega threes and omega sixes. Um, and kelp is really high in iodine and can be high in carbohydrates. So that's really good for thyroid function. Um, so each kind of dip is different. Um, they're all universally super nutritious and um, like high in antioxidants and micronutrients. And when you process them, it does change it. So that's actually something that uh, researchers at the University of Maine are looking at right now to quantify if you blanch the seaweed for you know, 15 seconds, what does that do to the nutritional profile versus if you blanch it for 30 seconds, how does that change it? Like, what do those graphs look like? Um, because as we think about seaweed moving forward, it's really important to know um, when you process it, obviously what you get out, if we're depending on using those properties to market seaweed. So, um, you know, it definitely does change it. I mean, I think drying is a good example. You can dry kelp like on, a, like in, in the sun. Um, and that's going to be pretty passive. And so the kelp will retain a lot of those um, like total phenolic content and a little bit more of the antioxidants versus if you expose it to heat in an oven, some of those will break down. So anyone who's ever eaten a sushi roll, I, I keep talking about nori and it's a red algae. So if you see a picture of nori as like a, what it looks like in the wild, it's going to be reddish brown. But then when you eat a sushi roll, it's green, right? So um, you have that green sheet and essentially what that is is the red and the brown pigments um, melt away because the chlorophyll is the strongest or one of the strongest pigments in seaweed so when you expose it to heat some things go like those uh like red pigments and some things are retained so excellent Patton would like to know are there any particular uses for sargasm so uh, this is not a, this is a, an area that I'm really interested in to learn more about because it's a tropical, it's more tropical um, than we have here, but you know, it does contain, it's a, it's a large brown algae. Um, so it's going to contain a lot mm. of the compounds that you would see in other similar types of seaweed. So uh, fertilizer is always an option for seaweed because it is so nutrient dense. Like plants love seaweed. If you think that there is not little seaweed flakes on these wall plants here, you are wrong. I put seaweed on all of my plants because they just love the nutrients. That's great. And we have a couple um, questions coming in about the products that you mentioned, but is there a list of recommended seaweed companies or farmers that people can support to get some of those products that you showed us? Yeah, so if you went, um, I can I can kind of share that the last slide that had the information about um, Seaweed Week here. I'll, I'll, we'll do a screen share again just to put it up there um, because that website, um, so it's uh, seaweedweek.org. And if I can just go back one, um, there's a lot of information about the products up there um, because that is, it, the whole week is a collaborative effort from farmers and businesses and processors and restaurants in, in Maine to kind of just celebrate seaweed. So it's everyone coming together and putting up recipes and putting up information. Um, so a lot of the products are there and a lot of the companies um, also are involved with Seaweed Week. Uh, another place that you could find information about seaweed uh, companies would be the Maine Seaweed Council. So I believe their website is just Maine Seaweed Council, but I could put that in the chat somewhere so that folks could have it if that's helpful. Sure, that's great. And then um, before we, if we go today, can you just uh, give us a little bit more about how um, you became interested in seaweed and then what your main role is, you know, working with those farmers, kind of like, what does your day-to-day -day look like? 
Yeah, well, nowadays my day-to-day -day looks a lot like this, um, but typically around this time of year, I'd be out on harvest boats, so uh, providing farmers with some support. Um, again, because this industry is so new, everyone's kind of trying out new things, and so it helps to have um, someone who has a little bit of a science background who can go out to farms and, and talk through with farmers, um, you know, what does the system look like? Is this working? Is this not working? And also, like, what information should I be bringing to the scientists and the researchers um, so that they know that these are the problems that you guys are seeing. So, you know, typically when uh, I explain what I do, the way that we always talk about extension is taking university knowledge and bringing that to uh, the public. But the part of my job that I think is the, the coolest is really taking that information like from the farmers and from the people who live and work on the coast and taking it back to the university and saying, these are the things that are really mattering to the people on the water. Um, these are the, you know, they've been seeing a lot of snails lately, or, you know, they need a new gear design. It's not working. And, and being able to work with uh, engineers or food processors or, you know, food scientists to really dive into those questions. So kind of making sure that there's a two-way communication between um, everyone involved. Um, so that way everyone kind of knows where the industry is at. Um, and the day-to-day -day can look totally different. Typically, it would be a lot of driving around. So Maine is a pretty big state. Um, you know, to get to some farm sites is about three hours plus for me. So sometimes that involves like a really early morning, drive three hours, get in a boat, harvest some seaweed, come back, um, do some emails. And um, so it, it is really different. Um, in addition to some of the industry work, I also work with teachers. So like the teacher, like the classroom setup that I showed there. So we, we work to support a network of teachers who are interested in doing aquaculture in the classroom and um, really work through the logistics of what that entails. You know, uh, instead of just like giving a manual, we try and help them find funding to get students to the coast or like to get students on a bus because um, frequently the biggest challenges are more complicated than can you do it? It's like, how do you do it? Great. And last question for today's virtual field trip. And that is, do you know how microplastics are affecting seaweed? Do they absorb it? Do you, have you seen any impact from the plastic issue that we have in our oceans? Yeah. So with seaweed, because it's not a filter feeder, um, it doesn't typically get in the seaweed. So something like um, an oyster, for example, is a filter feeder. So that's going to be processing all of the um, particulate matter in the water. Uh, seaweed is kind of absorbing the stuff you can't see. So it's those dissolved nutrients. So in terms of microplastics and seaweed, it's not actually going to be internal to the seaweed. But one concern would be if you have a seaweed with a lot of branches and then you harvest that and that gets put into a machine and gets made into products, um, you know, how much microplastic can be in those. Um, again, it's, it's kind of protected by nature of how it um, absorbs nutrients and kind of feeds, I guess you could say, but it, it is still a concern just because it can obviously get tangled in there and things. Uh, another way that it, it could potentially be an issue, um, you know, if you start processing the seaweed and there's plastic that's entrapped in some of those little folds. Great. Thank you so much to, uh, for joining us today, Jacqueline. Um, we had so much engagement, lots of questions. This was really fascinating. And I'm kind of hungry for some seaweed now. <laughs> but uh, before we go, I just wanted to wrap up uh, today and say a special thanks, obviously, to Jacqueline for joining us and sharing all of her knowledge about seaweed and kelp with us. We also want to say a big thank you to the Northrop Grumman Foundation. They are the sponsor of our expeditions program. And I would also like uh, to encourage everybody to follow along with uh, Earth Echo, as well as Maine Sea Grant and Seaweed Week on socials. We also have an email up there. If you have any questions, you can always send them our way. We are having a book giveaway right now. So if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel, head over to our Facebook page and see, and then that way you can enter our giveaway. So I also would like to invite everybody to check out www.earthecho.org where we have all of our programs, lots of great resources and videos that are all free for people to use. And lastly, I want to say thank you again for joining us today. I hope everyone stays safe out there and remember, keep exploring. Thank you. Thanks, Jacqueline. I like the picture of the giant kelp. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>